Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making it this morning and joining us for this fantastic event. My name is Veronica Fenbury. I am one of the co-chairs of the Africa Interest Group at the American Society for International Law. And it's such an honor to have these amazing speakers here this morning. And I look forward to learning a lot and having a lot of exchange and feedback and comments. So without further ado, I turn it over to our moderator and facilitator for today, Professor James Dollar, Professor Anthony Dollar, sorry. Um, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Veronica. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm going to start with myself. As you know, if you are in an airplane, they normally say oxygen max dropping means you help yourself first before you help others. So my name is Anthony Diallo. I'm based at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Our first panelist is um, Dr. Portia Owusu. Uh, just a brief introduction. She holds a PhD from the School of African and Oriental Studies at the University of London. She's officially an assistant professor of English at Texas A&M University in the US, but she's actually a specialist in African-American, African and diaspora literature with deep research interests in history, or historiography, memory, cultural philosophy, and contemporary narratives of slavery. She's the author of um, Spectres from the Past, Slavery and the Politics of History in West African and African-American Literature, which was published by Ruth Ledge in 2019. So her current project is on death and mourning in Africa and the diaspora. So without further ado, we call on Dr. Portia Owosu to speak. She's got a maximum of 15 minutes. Right, thank you so much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here in such an esteemed company. Um, so I want to begin by considering migration um, as an academic discipline. Its focus generally and what that focus or um, its tenant has done to understanding of the migration and immigration of peoples of African descent. So migration is relatively a new academic discipline. That is, although people have migrated and immigrated since the dawn of time, as a serious study is relatively new in the academic space. Um, so up until 20th century, the study of human movement and interactions were often limited to the disciplines of history and sociology. Um, so the study of migration as a scholarly um, discipline really and truly starts from the 20th century, like I said. And, and as such, um, as often, often it was rooted in trying to understand um, assimilation. So, for example, the Chicago School of Sociologists, for example, often looked at histories of human movement and assimilation, the process of, to which foreigners learn and absorb into the dominant cultures that they have moved into. And assimilation models um, in the early years of um, migration studies will often be um, predicated on outcomes for different um, socio groups. So outcomes such as, and we'll be looking at things such as policies that accept or support immigrants and migrants, labor markets, so economic situations that help people to excel or not to excel, and ethnic communities that are in place um, to support people who are coming and or people who are moving. So just a brief um, outline of these things. It's a shorthand, basically the focus was on um, legal or um, voluntary and if you like European migration, people of European descent. This focus as it's obvious to anybody does not allow for the study of people who um, are not of European descent and people who may not have traveled or moved through legal or voluntary basis. Forced migrations, slaveries, colonial migration, uprooting of in indigenous people were all, as a result of this singular focus, excluded from early and dominant uh, focus in migration studies. The focus on Western forms of migration, particularly, means that account of forced migrations are often ignored, and people who were forced to move either by through slavery or through crises such as war were not recognized as refugees. What this has done is place non-European migrants and immigrants as outside of the normative people who come to take rather than people who add to society. 
people who are marked by the inability or unwillingness to assimilate. In some, migrants and immigrants of non-European backgrounds were seen as problem to society rather than as part of the solution. The impact of this is evident all around us today, even for me as someone who doesn't concentrate on migration studies. Um, so we can see these impact, for example, in politics. It's not an accident that in every election cycle, whenever a politician is trying to make their name, immigration and migration is often at the top of the list. The immigration and migration of non-European people is often seen as a, as a go-to for fear-mongering, as a way to kind of scare people into voting for certain policies or voting for certain people because guess what? Um, they're coming to kind of take that belong to you. They're coming to take your jobs. They're coming to dilute your cultures. They're coming to take, 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 take. And the image of these um, people that are coming to take are often non-Europeans. We see this in society, the lack of empathy towards black and brown um, refugees. So think, for example, how we have embraced rightly um, Ukraine refugees in Europe and in America, but do we have the same energy for other people who have been uprooted by crisis? And when we do have empathy, the one or two occasions when we do have empathy is often predicated on this white savior complex, right? So we're saving them because we are good. We're saving them because we have something that we have. So it kind of, um, when we are, having empathy towards black and brown people or recognizing them as refugees, right? It's often done through kind of perpetuation of these old narratives of white savior or civilized mission that was at the heart of this, um, of colonialism and slavery, right? That we have something they have. Look at these poor black and brown people. If we do something for them, it's because we're good Christians, whereas they're not. The study of forced migration um, the absence of black and brown people, the absence of forced migration and slavery in the study of migration has also alienated things like slavery as a standalone, as a separate body. So remember, as I was saying that migration studies kind of came out of sociology and history because it was seen as those disciplines were not enough to encapsulate them. Not talking about slavery, not talking about forced migration, not seeing people who involuntarily were displaced or uprooted means that these things are often seen as a standalone. It has nothing to do with migration. So, for example, slavery is now kind of is its own academic discipline or is a standalone body of literature. What? Why do we need to change this? We need to change this, but why do we need to change this? By including forced migration. Um, people who traveled or moved as a result of crises, uh, people who were forcibly moved, and by including migration of non-Europeans in the dominant discourse of migration studies is good for us. Why? We get to challenge societal and political assumptions of the other, right? Um, we expand understanding of particular cultures and societies and how the interactions between different people and different cultures have shaped us as a people, have shaped our beliefs, have shaped our um, concept of national identities. We also get to have, and this is something that's very close to my own work as a literary scholar, we also get to have a more expansive understanding and definitions of freedom. So often we're thinking of freedom as this linear thing or this as homogenous freedom simply means being kind of unshackled, um, but that's not necessarily. Freedom, the definitions of freedom are often un undergirded by the experience of movement and what we have experienced. I consider myself as free because previously something made me feel unfree. Um, and also, so it's very much steep, uh, it's very much predicated on personal experience. For example, white pilgrims that came to the United States came here for religious freedom. And so the idea of being able to worship was freedom. But a black immigrant who came to from Africa, who came from the Middle East, their experience of slavery in uh, or their experience of racism, for example, in the United States might impede on the freedom. So different groups of people and different experiences challenges our definitions of freedom. Um, so the idea of including people does this, right? Also, so migration studies so really concerns itself with the, with the question of freedom. So including other people helps us to challenge those um, concepts. 
Furthermore, allowing for a broader understanding of other people, other people's experiences, allows us to better contextualize our contemporary issues and concerns. Um, right now, migration is a hot topic. It has always been. So including the body of work, including the experience of other people, we get to look at the lived experiences of different people in terms of being stateless, people who are vulnerable to, um, for example, discretionary policing, and also people who still today are susceptible to coercive laboring. So for example, it's not, um, we're often, you often read literature that will tell you that there are more slaves today than there were in the transatlantic slave trade. God knows where they're getting those statistics from, but including other people's experience of movement help us to truly contextualize and help us to interrogate that. So that is my two cents in terms of kind of like where we're going in terms of um, including um, black and brown people, or indigenous people as part of the dominant discourse in this discipline that we call migration studies. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Pasha. Um, for questions, we encourage you to type them in the question and answer box, and we shall um, deal with them um, in a group manner. So let's hold off on the questions now and move straight to our next presenter. And that would be Professor Valentine Udo James. Um, yes, I see he's here. Okay, so he's a professor of environmental management planning and policy at Pennsylvania West, Western University in the US. He holds a PhD in urban and regional science, a master of arts in environmental science and a bachelor of science in biology. So Professor James was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California. He's the founding editor in chief of the Journal of Sustainable Development in Africa. He has written and edited 14 books and serves as editor-in-chief or editor of 11 academic journals. He has won several awards naturally and has held various leadership positions in American universities. So Professor Udo, thank you for coming and please you can take the floor. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be a part of these esteemed uh, discussions. Um, it has always been a pleasure of mine to participate in programs like this and to bring to the fore discussions about development. So my discussion today would focus on displacement induced, uh, sorry, development induced displacement. I would also try to shed some light on the matter of conservation of natural resources and how that has actually led to some displacement. And then I'll end up talking about uh, concerns about eminent domain um, and how eminent domain has been adopted by governments across Africa. And by so doing, have actually led to a lot of problems, which are not just physical displacement, but also displacement that is caused by some kind of economic hardship, uh, social problems that have emanated because of all those kinds of draconian steps that have been taken by governments. Uh, and so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Now let's start by looking at development induced uh, displacement in the African context. Um, there's been a publication in the Journal of Internal Displacement uh, written by Saf Safizia Ahmad Nuhu. And he states, and I quote, Prior to the adoption of the AU Convention for IDPs in Africa, no binding treaty existed for the protection of internally displaced persons. Uh, this gap in legal protection has for a long time posed serious human rights and humanitarian problems as the number of IDPs kept escalating while that of refugees substantially re regress, despite the notion that conflict is the main cause of displacement. The reality is that every year, more and more people are displaced by natural disasters of displacement. The reality is that also that development projects of, across Africa 
have actually led to a number of very, very serious problems. It is on that note that I begin to lay my emphasis on the problems of displacement that are actually quite enormous because of development. I am a planner by training, and so that my emphasis would be on those. So let me begin by also noting uh, work that was done by uh, Mr. Harrison Dunning, who was actually looking at law and economic development in Africa. And he actually notes, and I quote here, today virtually every African government places rapid economic development high on its public, public uh, list. Uh, of national priorities. Government planning concentrates, however, on channeling human and material resources into infrastructure projects and productive activities conducive to economic growth, uh, quote unquote. That gives us the idea now that we have to begin to think quite seriously these, what I call massacring, major action that significantly uh, affect the quality of human environment. Uh, let me begin by those institutions that are at the very center of development, the IMF, the World Bank, the EU, and of course, to some extent, the AU. And if we, we will classify you know, multinational corporations as being at the very center of infrastructure. That brings me to the discussion of what the role of you know, the oil companies have been in actually put in your infrastructure into the African environment. Nigeria is one good example. Um, Sudan is another example where oil expo exploitation have actually led to a number of very serious problems. Spills consequences cause conflicts between communities, individuals and oil companies uh, have conflicts because of all these kinds of development. Destruction of cultural areas, and spirituality actually exists in many, many of these places. The Ogoni land in Nigeria is one good example where displacement of over uh, 3,000 people have actually led to populations moving from those, you know, my areas into the cities. And when they get to the cities, they become, uh, they've posed enormous problems financially and socially for those who are arriving and also for the communities that they actually get into. And so Nigeria is one good example where that has actually been quite dramatic. There's been lawsuit in recent times against Shell Oil Company. And even as recently as this year, there are about 13,000 people who have sued, you know, the oil company wanting reparations. The fact of the matter is that when we look at the collaboration between the oil companies and government, they are always in cahoots. And so there comes this thing now where the, when, you, when you have the governments having these draconian laws, which has to do with the law of eminent domain, that is giving power to governments to take property or what belongs to an individual or a group of people, usually is the indigenous people. They take that property without just compensation. And sometimes when the compensation comes in form of settlements, they are not really up to par of what is expected. And so something has to be done in terms of putting together legislations and also involving communities at all phases of development, beginning with the very initial stage of development, which means the planning phase, the construction phase, and the implementation phase. Those are the kinds of things that we need to put into place to bring about a sense of justice for the people that have actually been displaced because of infrastructure development. There are dams that are being constructed across many places that have rivers. Uh, there are other transportation routes that are actually constructed and the impact on the ecological systems that we have all across Africa. We have to take these kinds of displacement quite seriously and put legislation into place to work with governments to help them to help the people that are being displaced. And so these are very, very good things to do um, to bring about some very serious changes within Africa. The other thing I wanted to talk about is that of conservation. Um, we want to protect areas across Africa that have endemic species. And this is good because conservation helps us to actually bring about tourism into play of economic development. 
I think if you look at the global market in terms of tourism, Africa only gets about 7% of that global market. I think conservation is good for on one aspect, but on the other aspect, it actually displaces indigenous people. So what do we do? There are examples of new initiatives that have actually been funded by USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, in collaboration with Conservation International, which is an NGO in the United States, and they work hand in hand with indigenous people across Africa. One good example, and I don't know how many of my audience actually know or are aware of a place called Kakum in Ghana. Kakum National Park was created from scratch, where American scholars, planners, scientists with monies from USAID with that initiative guided by Conservation International worked in collaboration with Ghanaians. And during that time, Rawlings was in power. It was quite collaborative. What they did in the design of Kalkun paid attention to interpretation, interpretations to two groups of people, interpretation to the international community that would come and do research to look at endemic species of butterflies to actually conserve them for further research. The other interpretation was to Ghanaians and Africans, making sure that our understanding that when Africans can use their resources, they would give the steady income that is needed to preserve those things. And of course, we know what happens when there's a dependence of monies coming from the North. You know, when we had COVID, it was quite disastrous for many parts of Africa. The police kept, you know, they stopped coming. And so when we have interpretation for both groups, uh, that is to Africans and to the international communities, we can actually preserve our natural resources and we can plan for the conservation of our resources in such a way that it embraces the indigenous people and doesn't displace Africans, which is really the problems when we have initiatives that are just one-minded, when we have it being interpreted just for the Western people to enjoy and not taken into play, you know, how Africans actually use those natural resources. I think the concept now for making conservation not displace people is to design parks that embrace the cultures of African societies and also be able to interpret them to how Westerners want to use those places for research and want to use those places for tourism. And so what we do then is to look at how agriculture can be practiced in those reserves and how land use can be done that embraces the, you know, the cultures of the people. Those are the kinds of solutions that I'm actually suggesting as the way forward. And, and then to work with governments so that they don't have these draconian processes that actually displaces people uh, and doesn't pay attention to how people use their resources. The Ghanaian experience, you know, has actually taught the rest of the world on how to do it, but it also points to other developments across Africa where mining has actually been a problem in, in terms of the governments using these, you know, this eminent domain power uh, to displace people and not paying attention to how people are being settled and compensated. Now, the story is that people are not just, they're not compensated fully. And even when resettlements are done, they don't embrace a long-term re resettlement and job creation. What we often forget is that the indigenous people have economies that are informal and those informal economies thrive. And so when we have, you know, projects that come in and displaces them, it really ruins the whole society. The third aspect I want to talk about is the, 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 the aspect of infrastructure development. Infrastructures are great and they should be done in such a way that we actually do studies that have to do with impact assessment, that is EIA. Impact assessment are often done for major projects that significantly affect the quality of human environment, but oftentimes the recommendations that are made about how these processes should be taking place are not taken seriously or they are abandoned. I think that's problematic. We should find ways of having these you know, environmental impact statements, which are documents done before a major pro project has actually taken place. I think once that's done, 
making sure that we pay attention to those details, those recommendations, displacement would have little impact on the overall economy of many of our places across Africa. I think given those three aspects then, we can begin to move forward on how to deal with this. I was in preparation, in preparing for my uh, conversation with you today, I was actually searching through the publication on this subject. It just so happens that 10 years ago, uh, an author by the name of Bukri, who actually teaches at Niger Delta University in Nigeria, wrote a very seminal paper uh, that I published. I didn't even remember it, but my research actually pointed me to it. When I discovered it, Okokri addresses how to deal with this matter of displacement. He said there are linkages between all based environmental issues, degradation and displacement. And that when we pay attention to those linkages, we can actually begin to make a difference. Those linkages have to do with, you know, the breakdown in our systems that lead to people not being compensated, that lead to people being displaced. Because once people are displaced, they do not only lose the biological diversity of the environment, they also lose what we call cultural diversity. In such cases, languages begin to disappear. And that's quite frightening. Um, and we have to do better. Um, and as I said to you at the very beginning of my talk, I'm an environmental planner by training and environmentalist, and I pay attention to the details of what happens, the consequences of displacement. And we have to deal with it with using law, making compensations, and involving the people at the early stages of development. That's the route to go about. And that's my two cents to the conversation this morning. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor James, um, for that very insightful presentation. Um, we are going to once again leave the questions for later and move on to our third presenter. So our third speaker is Professor Yoki Wen. She's a professor in the University of uh, Montario, sorry, University of Toronto, and chair of the Department of Social Justice Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. An accomplished educator, researcher, and educational leader, she headed the Institute's Office of Teaching Support from 2009 to 2012. She was previously special advisor on the status of women issues at the University of Toronto, advisor on equity, diversity, and inclusion for the Vice President Human Resources and Equity, and director of the Center for Integrative Anti-Racism Studies. She has received many teaching awards. The most recent is the president of Toronto Teaching Award. Um, her most recent book is From My Mother's Back, A Journey from Kenya to Canada, published in 2020. And then for those who do not know, um, Professor Wen is my colleague at Panastrad International, um, a policy think tank. So it's good to see you again, Professor Wen. You're welcome. And the floor is yours. Yeah, if you can unmute. Yeah, if you can unmute, yeah. Yeah, I have done. Thank you, Anthony, for that introduction. Before I begin, I want to do the customary thing that I have learned over the years by giving thanks, giving thanks and acknowledging my ancestors, the ancestors that have experienced a lot of displacement, disruption, from the continent of Africa uh, since enslavement and uh, the, the various movements that they found themselves being brought to the Americas. I also want to acknowledge the ancestors of the land I mean that is in, in Canada and also their dislocation and displacement. And um, I want to invite them as I do my presentation this morning. My, the title of my presentation is Africans as Refugees of Body, Mind, Spirit. And the reason why I do, I, I'm talking about mind, body, and spirit, because usually when we think of being a refugee, we actually think of the body moving and we never, you know, we, we, we forget that we can be refugees of the mind, even where we are, 
we can be refugees of the spirit in addition to being a refugee of our own culture, our own ways of worshiping and so on and so forth. And in my presentation today, what I'm doing is I am using four Ds, disruption, destruction, dislocation, and displacement. And I'm so glad to see that my two colleagues that presented before me, they actually touched on these uh, elements, bodies at various points of the, uh, their presentation. I have two guiding questions. This is my outline. And also I'll try to situate my presentation in the past as well as in the current situation of the, the, the refugee cases of mind, body, spirit, and all the other things I've mentioned. I'll talk a little bit about Faruntare uh, and what the, pro uh, the problematics of the Faruntare kind of you know, movement, and then, of course, the enforced movements. And when I talk about the enforced movements, I'll be talking about enslavement that was touched. I'll talk a little bit about colonization. And then I'll talk about just a little bit. All these are very, very brief aspects of what I'm talking about in relation to our conversation that will follow. The, 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 the enforcement, the, the, the movement during this current time. And then, um, so my two guiding questions are, what do I mean by being a refugee of mind, body, and spirit? What do I mean by that? And I really want the audience to reflect on what that means to each one of them. What does it mean? And then my second question is, what, what does it to take to liberate ourselves from that situation of being a refugee in terms of our mind, in terms of our physical body, in terms of our spirituality, in terms of our emotional, political, cultural, and economic aspects of it, what does it mean? How do we address emotionally the various disrupt, uh, disruptions? How do we address the, destruction, the destructive elements of this movement? And, um, and how do we find ourselves bringing some settlements in terms of our physical body, our mind, and uh, our, our spirit? Let me look at the, the context, the context of the African continent. Looking at Africa historically, we used to have movements and interactions way before slavery. Africa was the epicenter of the world. We used to have the Europeans come pass through Africa, going to get their spices from India. We used to have trades between Africa and, and the Americas. You can read at the work they came before Columbus. So our movement did not start with enslavement because that has, this is what has been emphasized over and over and over again. It was not. And then, so we find that the people who made Africa the, the epicenter of the world were seeking forms of knowledge. We do know that there were universities that people used to seek. We do know that Africa was the center where philosophers from all over the world, where the philosophers that are emphasized today as the, the fathers of philosophers were trained in Africa and so on and so forth. And then, so Africa was really, 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 you know, like that place you needed to go to. But what we never paid attention as people of African ancestry is the visitors as they were coming, they were actually, we were the center of study. They were mastering what we were doing. They were mastering the various social organization, organizations of our government. They were looking for the, the weak links within the African cultures. So as a result of that, currently we find that Africa, when you mention the one Africa, is marked by colonial oppression. We are struggling with colonial legacies. We are struggling with colonial political um, aspects of who we are. We, I mean, economically, and it has been mentioned, we are struggling in every aspect of it, spiritually, mentally, and so on and so forth. You know, I'll talk a little bit about disruption 
and uh, destruction via enslavement. When we welcomed uh, the Europeans, when we welcomed the Arabs for purposes of trade, after they mastered our weak links, after they noticed that when the various um, kingdoms and nations were starting to, co you know, to, to collapse, very deceitfully they said, let's take your problem, this, you know, the, 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 the prisoners of war for you. And of course, you know, without any questions, we, we, we accepted it was a problem well taken care of. And slowly, slowly, for five, almost 400 years, people were taken away to the point where we became, uh, we were the mercy of the Europeans. We were so, literally every able-bodied person was taken away from Africa. And what happened after that is that all the, 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 the African continent, the people who are left there were young people, and the old people, complete destruction, complete disruption of who we were as people of African ancestry. And in addition to that, there was destruction and the disruption of our education, our social systems, our culture. And for me, that was the beginning of refugee, Levy, uh, refugee at every aspect of it. And of course, it was also the beginning of the disruption of the spirit, the disruption of mistrust. We People of African ancestry stopped entrusting each other, stopped trusting each other, because it was taken that we are giving away, we are selling our own people. And that distrust has been followed us throughout, even currently, it has been part of the challenges that we face as people of African ancestry. And of course, um, if I can talk a little bit in terms of the dislocation and displacement, in terms of the geographical displacement, the people who are taken as enslaved because I, they did not take slaves from Africa, people became enslaved when they landed on the continent of the Americas when they landed in, their, in the Arab world. And that dislocation from their geographical space, uh, the space that was familiar to them, you can imagine the fear that was created within them. You can imagine the engravement of being refugee, not only mentally, but physically, where they were whipped, where they were killed, where they were set on dogs, where they were misused, they sexually abused. They, you know, like it's it's something, it's a it's a creation of a, a refugee that is very difficult to uproot from. And of course, there is this other element of dislocation and displacement of culture. I'll emphasize that yes, there appears to have been that disruption of culture or ways of knowing, indigenous ways of knowing. But many people of African ancestry, what they did was they hated, they, 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 they literally, it went into a dormant state. But that, the cultural ways of knowing of people of African ancestry, if you interview people who have, you know, been passed on from enslavement or even in, in Kent, those aspects of our cultural ways of knowing are still there. So yes, there might appear to have dislocation and displacement of, of culture, but technically it's intact and we need to go and pick it up from, you know, uh, from where it has been, where there was that dislocation and, and disruption. The most, di you know, displacement and destruction and dislocation was the family. And we find that today, I, I keep crying, not physical crying when I think that my family, most of my family is in Africa, in Kenya. I have elders who are sick, but I'm displaced here. That, that fragmentation of who we are creates a refugee, even for the people on the, this side of the world, as, as well as the family members who are out there in, in, on the continent. I mean, 
you know, spiritually we were completely, completely dislocated and displaced. But the beauty of it is our spirituality as people of African ancestry, I always say it's intact and it should not be confused with religion because people of African ancestry are rooted within the, uh, the, 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 the spiritual aspects of it. And when you feel you're a complete refugee in wherever you are, you can actually create a sanctuary where you can have your, you have a, you, you can have a communication, a commune with your spirit. And that in itself enables us to be able to, to survive and to move from day to day. You know, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, enslavement in terms of the new homes. I don't even need to describe the conditions through which we found ourselves in. Because people have written about enslavement and the conditions of enslavement and the brutality of the enslavement. But based on the research that I've done is, there is an element that we are completely destroyed, but we are not. I, looking at the various documentaries, I've, I've talked about, I've, I've seen how there was a lot of resiliency, how there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of subversion, how there was, like, for instance, the various trade uh, map routes were braided on our hair so that you could actually read a map as you're trying to escape. And that in itself was a way of showing that we as people of African ancestry, we can escape. We can escape from being refugees. When we look at the colonial times, the scramble for Africa, the dividing of the Africa, we, we, we totally bowed to the whiteness. And it continues up to the present day. However, I'll keep emphasizing that there are few pockets of people of African ancestry within the continent that do not bow to whiteness, that have stuck to their own culture. And, uh, uh, you know, looking, you know, so during the colonial times, it, it's, it was mind boggling in terms of how you know, the destruction of our education, the destruction of everything that I've talked about, our culture, our spirit, and so on and so forth. Let's look at the present time, the new colonial times. People of African ancestry, whether they have come here for Untere because of the displacement of the colonial logic, or they have been displaced because of the wars that its origin are colonial uh, coloniality, or the, the all kinds of displacement that have taken place. There is a level of discrimination. When the refugees from the continent land either in Europe or here, instead of being welcomed, they are treated like they are not human. They don't get the same level of uh, treatment that the, the refugees from Kosovo, the refugees from Europe, the refugees from other parts of the world are treated. They are treated differently. They are classified differently as, as they counter with, with the border patrols. We have cases of the people of Haiti when they try to, to come here. They are treated differently. We have seen how, for instance, uh, when it comes to the, the, the even the settlement, the settlement, the settlement, um, and uh, the, the lawyers will know this. The immigration lawyers will know this. When there is a case of um, of uh, of case of refugee people of African descent, they are totally totally treated differently. And then let's look at during the, the you know, the, these new times when, you know, people are being welcomed, especially domestic labor from the Caribbean. They had to be forced to come here alone. They were not allowed to bring their family. They left their children back home, another dislocation. And so, so we can actually see the level of dehumanization from time immemorial to today, I usually like to leave ourselves with an action item because we can complain, but I always say that 
we are the ones that can rectify the situation that we are in. I always say that we need to take responsibility. And the first responsibility that we should take is to ensure that we have the knowledge from the past. Because unless we know our history, we'll be asking ourselves, what are we going back to? We need to go back and learn our history. And we need to add that knowledge, that indigenous ways of knowing of people of African ancestry to the various institutions that we are part of. We are responsible for that. And the second thing is oh, people of African ancestry, uh, you know, we, we situate ourselves in what I call various principles, like the principle of respect, the principle of honesty, truth, sincerity, humanness, as part of who we are. And it's very, very, very important for us to start thinking of how can we introduce these principles to situate our teachings, to situate the governance within the various organizations we, we find ourselves in. Because I find there is a lot of insincerity. There is a lot of, you know, even the language that people are addressed with is not there. We need to take that responsibility and find ways of introducing that. We need to engage ourselves in conversations to create new strategies to challenge the, you know, the refugee policies. We as people in the learned institutions, we need to formulate ways of coming together and challenging those refugees that affect people of African ancestry. And I always say that uh, last but not least is that we have to remember Knowledge is not outside oneself. It's already within us. It's covered with a golden disk of illusions. By being aware, awake, and present in the moment, one is able to release the spirit within. This is from Kumar, um, who quoted that in 2003. I would like to leave you with a couple of proverbs. You know, as, uh, as a woman of African ancestry, I like to wind and to leave you with something to think about. And I usually use my own vernacular, my own language. And what I'm saying is that there is nothing that doesn't, does not have a beginning there is nothing that does not have an end. So yes, we have been refugees at a particular point, but at a particular point in our, in our line, in our path, we should be able to be free, mentally, spiritually, culturally, and everything else. Asante Sana, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wen. Thank you for that very detailed um, historical journey to the problems of migration and displacement. So our last but not the least speaker is um, the Reverend Dr. David N. Moore, Jr. He is a pastor, a human rights advocate, and an adjunct university professor living in Santa Barbara, California. So he leads the Santa Barbara Community Church and also Jesus Collective, an online community. He serves on several local advocacy organizations, including the California Central Coast Plan Parenthood. He is first vice president of the Santa Barbara branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Pastor David obtained his master's degree from St. Stephen's University in New Brunswick in Canada and his doctorate in theology from the University of South Africa. He has been married to the same woman, Diane, for the past 45 years and they have five adult children. Um, Pastor David, I look forward to when you will clock him 70 years of married life. <laughs> thank you very much and you can please take it away. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh... As uh, Professor Wane raised and is in all of our hearts, I recognize our ancestors. It's not lost on me today that I'm the only one missing my African name. 
I, uh, I too recognize the first inhabitants of my region here in Santa Barbara, uh, the Chumash peoples. I would like to begin by drawing a contrast with settler colonialism, just to review. Historically, examples of settler colonialism include the colonization of indigenous lands by European powers in regions such as North America, Australia, New Zealand, and to a lesser degree, Africa. Settler colonialism differs from other forms of colonialism in that it aims to create new societies or communities that are often based on the settlers' cultural, economic, and political systems rather than simply exploiting the land and resources of the colonized territory for the benefit of the colonizing power. Settler colonialism has had long-lasting and profound impacts on indigenous peoples, including the loss of land, resources, culture, and autonomy, as well as the perpetuation of social, economic, and health disparities that continue to affect indigenous communities to this day. In either case, whether peoples are displaced by settlers or the kind of colonialism that has afflicted most of Africa, however and wherever colonization has happened, the world's great peoples are saying things like, we face scorching desert winds, or I live in a tent, or we need, we need our native food, our children need education. So even if humanitarians build five-star refugee camps, they are still refugees. This would include indigenous American populations, except we call refugee camps reservations or reserves. The people are poor. Here in the Americas, there are multiple refugee crises underway. Like Africa and other parts of the world, it is almost always indigenous families that flee their ancestral lands. In the United States, we see a flood of South Americans and Central Americans fleeing violence. In most cases, they are the people closest to the, the earth, the land, and they've been displaced by those with a greater share, displaced by those who have a greater share of European blood. There are extremely wealthy people in Mexico, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Peru. The wealthy are rarely the ones seeking asylum unless they have committed crimes against a nation that became fed up with them. Then they may move to Florida. Again, in the United States, we see a flood of South Americans and Central Americans fleeing violence. These are people whose governments and economies were destabilized by the United States. This is like the scenario where Africans seek safety in Europe, Canada, Australia, and the US, around the world. A quick thought as an African American. With a few notable exceptions, African Americans have historically struggled for their rights within the settler colonial system. Only occasionally have we vocally advocated for indigenous populations in North America because African Americans have sought to find a place within this brutal capitalist system. We observe how this system benefits whites, especially white men, and we seek similar benefits. We as African Americans have fought for such benefits for centuries, and yet we have watched other nationalities migrate here only to pass us by, especially Irish, Irish and Italians. So the two most heavily controlled people groups in North America are both the indigenous and the African. One, the indigenous, rejects the cultural, economic, and political systems of the dominant system. And the other, the African-American, accepts the settler's order. The disparate politics of indigenous and African-Americans are a survival response to the distinct methods that the white man has used to dominate each group. Indigenous nations are demanding that the federal government honor its treaties with them. 
African Americans have never had treaties, of course, and as such have appealed to the US Constitution for rights. Indigenous nations have never expected anything on constitutional terms. Make no mistake, the dominant system is driven by capital, but it is also propelled by racism. I think it will ultimately be futile for African Americans to overlook the indigenous in North America, just as it is unfruitful for Pan-Africans to overlook our indigenous family, including in our motherland. In 1965, Malcolm X fam famously said, the American white man has so thoroughly brainwashed the black man to see himself as only a domestic civil rights problem that it will probably take longer than I live before the Negro sees that the struggle of the African black, uh, of the American black man is international. The common origin of our oppression is the white man and the white man's systems. Were it not so tragic, I would be amused that last month the United States sent Vice President Kamala Harris to the continent to strengthen the West's interests for fear of Chinese growth. While I have no great fondness for the authoritarian Chinese regime, which persecutes a number of her peoples, including but not limited to Tibetans and Uyghurs, it is not the Chinese that plundered Africa. It is the white world. It is not the Chinese who are the source of historic African losses. It is the white world. The problems addressed in the United Nations Refugee Convention of 1951 endeavors to formulate a white solution by the white world for crises created by the white world. In fact, the white world is by and large the cause of African refugeeism through colonization, through the devastation of resources and environmental waste. So even though the delightful Kamala Harris is the delivery woman, I am confident that, that Africans will evaluate closely what she is delivering to ensure that Africa looks out for Africa. For who is the white man to protect Africans? Who is the white man to protect Africans when the white man still kills your brothers and sisters on this side of the Atlantic? The Atlantic that is grave to millions of your African family and of our African family. We have seen this movie before. Not until 25 years ago did my own country begin to admit our Pan-African Haitian refugees legally. Haiti is just one of the many countries laid waste by the white world. Haitians have fled to the United States for reasons similar to that of African refugees fleeing the white world, even the black world. The whole of the white world has turned, it, turned its back on the refugee convention, now even erecting physical barriers. The United States has never been in compliance with the refugee convention. And regarding Mrs. Harris, I wanna emphasize that we need system insiders in government, finance, in education, in sport, and in religion, in publishing, in journalism, in cinema, in theater. Right now, we have people who are skilled, gifted, and ambitious, and are making necessary and urgent impacts that systems must provide us. They must do this, however, with the understanding that they are the fire brigade. They are there to douse fires, but fire brigades have temporary roles. We must all grow our imagination for a world beyond the emergency of white supremacy. Pan-Africans should be proud of what we are achieving, and yet we must not become so intoxicated with representation that we forget that these are dying systems. When we further awaken to our power, which is the power of love and solidarity, we will heal Africa and her indigenous peoples. Finally, let us bear in mind that the white world separates Pan-Africans with an ocean of unconsciousness. But not only, for when Africans migrate here to the United States, the white world's systems still work at keeping us oceans apart. Yes, Africans and African-Americans are often ideologically divided, and to this, I say it benefits those who deny our humanity. We African-Americans know this tactic well, and 
As a theologian, I must acknowledge that one of the primary devices the white world uses to fragment our diasporic peoples and all the world, all of the world's colored peoples, they use Christianity as a means of domination and mind control. I am part of a multiracial coalition determined to take Jesus back from the Christians. In summary, I would say that all oppressed peoples who are not indigenous, all oppressed peoples who are not indigenous would be well served to unite with their indigenous neighbors. We in North America, with some 624 indigenous tribes and Africans with the 50 million indigenous people on the continent, we all need each other. Look at us here today. Africa is arising. So in the words of public enemy, I close, got to give us what we want, got to give us what we need. Our freedom of speech is freedom or death. We got to fight the powers that be. Let me hear you say, fight the power, fight the power. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moore. Thank you to every presenter for all these individual brilliant presentations that have enriched our knowledge and awakened or rather reawakened our consciousness of forced migration and displacement across the world. So yes, we are now here to the most interesting part of our session, which is the question and answer session or the interactive discussion session. So I don't know who wants to kick off. All you need to do is to maybe unmute yourself and then you will get the thumbs up to, to speak. So do I presume that um, Professor James wants to speak because he is unmuted? Yes, I am. I, if you give me the floor, I'll do so. <laughs> I want to point yes. So one very important thing that we have to make a note of. Globalization is here to stay. It's our reality. Uh, countries would collaborate and cooperate. Governments would make mistakes. They would have policies in place that would invite circumstances that would lead to displacement. Those circumstances are called, they're put under the umbrella of development. Uh, people make money at the expense of the public. And, and it worries me. And, and so my method of madness to counteract this whole thing is to find ways to develop policies that would enable us to be strong and defend anything that would lead to displacement. And that means that citizens' engagement with their governments would be very, very important at this point. We have to look at those three components I mentioned. Infrastructure development is what multinational corporations do, and governments take loans to do those same things without even the experience and the background to do them safely. I think that's so important. We have to be holding governments accountable. We need the help. You know, this is why I say I'm not looking forward to salvation coming from outside of Africa. I think Africans can do it. We have the talents, we have the know-how. What we have to fight against is those within us who kowtow to the, to the outside and make us victims. That is so important. There is an awareness in the diaspora. And I must say this very, very, I wouldn't stress this long enough. In the diaspora, there are talents here willing to collaborate. I can speak from my own experience. I'm engaged in development in Nigeria. I'm building a whole community based on my expertise and experience. It's expensive. Sometimes it is frustrating, but it, that's where we are. We just can't give up. We have to confront it. We have to do, we have to look for people of like minds to help us. And there are people. You know, it, it, we have to organize and it's so important and we have to, you know, do something in educating the young people of today. I do something in my class, you know, on sustainable development that is so well received. I have my students look at the 17 
sustainable development goals. And I say to them, where is Africa? And how much has Africa's problems been addressed in the 17 sustainable development goals? The results that are being presented by, stu by my students are alarming, very little not as much as everywhere else. There's more being spent on efforts outside of Africa than it is within Africa. So we want to readdress, we want to address that. We want to take it to those powers that be outside of Africa and say, yeah, we want our share. And within Africa, we also talk to our people to say, this is what we want. So in infrastructure development, we have to be much more responsible on conservation, which is, you know, you know I'm glad I have, uh, an East African colleague here on the, on the panel. Uh, Kenya fascinates me. And I've been to Uganda several times, you know, kind of mapping the parks and seeing how the parks are utilized. How many of these things are actually getting the cooperations of Africans or the understanding of Africans as to what resources that they do have? That engagement is so important. Not just, we have to fight governments to say, well, you can't do this. And that's beginning to pay off in the country of Ghana. It is even much more responsible now for every development. They are now saying, who are those going to be, who are going to be impacted even before the projects begin. And when the projects are in place, those that are resettled, they have to account for their long-term, you know, satisfaction, job creation. All of those things are important. So what I'm saying here, in that aspect of infrastructure development, conservation, and agriculture. Most people don't know that agriculture moved from, from what it used to be a self-sufficiency to a matter of cash crops. It is the cash crops that we're investing in now in Africa that is helping to displace people in Africa. It, that cannot continue. And we use chemically-based substances in our production, which actually is environmentally insane. These things can be done well with engagement of people and the training of people to be quite aware. And taking you know, these you know, international organizations to task in their development efforts. I think that's where it is. Policies must be developed in the era of globalization. It is here. The genie is out of the box. And, and, and we, have, we have to look at developing policies that would make Africa much more engaging and to stop this displacement. It is those development that we're engaging in that does not really fit into the carrying capacity of our ecological systems that is leading to displacement. That's what I needed to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor James. Um, that was quite um, a lot. And I admire your passion that at this stage in your academic career, you've still got that fire in your belly. Um, some of us are becoming rather cynical about solutions to African problems, specifically problems of forced displacement, migration, bad governance, and the rest of them. But it's good to see that um, we haven't given up completely. Thank you very much for that, that uh, those remarks. Okay, um, do we have anyone else? I'm looking to see if someone is unmuted. Right, yeah, yeah. Professor Wen. Yeah, I want to say thank you to the, you know, the contributions by my esteemed colleagues. As a sociologist and uh, as somebody who was steeped in uh, business, you know, studies in management of resources, and um, and then training myself to be a historian, I hear the passion of each one of you. And I want to come back to what uh, David talked about. We do have we do have historical problems that we need to address. And until we find ways of addressing those historical uh, problems. And I talked about the, about that trust. We have to find ways of collapsing, collapsing the boundaries that the, the colonizer created between us 
and the African Americans. When I talk about us, I'm talking about the African continent. You know, somehow that divide, if we don't address it, knowing that the way the Americas is today is due to the development of people of African ancestry, the African Americans are responsible for the development of the Americas. And we can, can you imagine if we were to unite and take all those talents to be part and parcel of the development within the continent, how far we'll move. But at every move, what happens is that they are curtailing how we can move together as, as people who are united, not only by um, the skin color, but by prehistorical roots. Yes, I know that the experiences have been very, very, very different, but we need to go. I keep talking about Sankofa. I keep talking of going back to our roots. And I emphasize in every class that I have that we need to go back. We need, we need to be reborn in order to rebuild the new world. I'm so glad, uh, James, you mentioned about Kenya. Kenya is the most colonized country I've ever seen in the world. We are so colonized. We worship the whiteness. I'll tell you, the I was in Kenya late last year, and here I am on the queue at the immigration, and this immigration officer beckons a white person to move in front of me. I walked, I said, no, this is my country. How long are you going to be colonized? How long are you going to be having internalized racism? And the guy said, no, 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 no. I am not a racist. I said, you are, you are, you are discriminating against me. We need to decolonize the minds of the people within the continent. We are steeped in colonization. We are steeped in colonization. And it, I can give you, I can give you 101 examples of how we look at our judges. We are still wearing the heavy heat of the hearts of the judges from, from Britain. Oh my God. We, you know, we have no, Kenya has no culture. I am from Kenya, but we are literally deculturalized. Okay. But we need to come up with a think tank because we cannot rebuild. We cannot rebuild what was lost in a nutshell. It's taking one step at a time, building a think tank and going back to our schools because our future depends on those children. Children from the mm -hmm. continent, the children here, they need to be reconnected with their African roots. And, and, and I know there are a lot of African-Americans who are reconnected with their African roots. And I'll say this. One time, Professor Mulevia Sante was talking to Shark Diop, who has written about the African civilizations. And before he passed away, he had a conversation with him and he said, you know, I really want to come and, you know, I really want to move to Africa and develop the Africa. And uh, what uh, Shark Diop said is that Africa lives in you. You don't need to move from wherever you are to be at the continent. Africa is in you. It has been passed down generation after generation through our blood. It is an, it's engraved, it's written in our blood. And so it's, in addition to having a think tank, on the cultural aspects of Africa and African peoples, we need to, you know, to, to, to start creating relationships. We need to trust each other. We don't, you know, when, um, you know, and we don't trust each other as people in the continent. Kenyans don't trust Nigeria. Nigerians don't trust Kenya. We, we don't trust South Africans. We don't, we, you know, what is, what's our problem? We need to, we need to literally do a deep 
reflection. And I'm hoping we can have another session where we need to deeply, deeply reflect on what needs to be done to decolonize us, to decolonize our education, to decolonize our economics, to decolonize every aspect of who we are, to decolonize our writing skills, to decolonize and to emphasize we hand it all before the destruction took place. I'm very passionate. <laughs> and I, I say thank you, thank you for the collaborators here. I'm hoping our conversation can come up with a with a with a publication. That's where I'm leading to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wen. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, the, this issue has run pretty deep. Um, but I think we should speak a little bit more, and I'm glad that you've given us some pointers. I want us to speak a little bit more about solutions, or potential solutions to these problems. Because we all know what the issues are, but what we disagree on are the solutions to these issues. So yeah, yeah. let's see what we can say in the can few I jump minutes. Can I here? Is, is it yes, okay if yes. I just... Uh, yes. And I think this may lead us to perhaps thinking of of solutions, but I wanted to respond to Professor Professor Wane just now, who 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 described her experience as a Kenyan in Kenya, being invisible in her own country, where the clerk saw the person behind her because that person was white. Uh, another another problem there is that that white person may have accepted the invitation to walk around you. And that is really an example of what we deal with in the world, that the, unco the unconsciousness of whiteness makes us invisible in every from every vantage point. And we have to understand that. We have to understand that to, to, to the colonized mind, we are invisible. And the only way that we can get past this is we have to see one another we have to render each other visible. So we have to uplift, you know, we, regardless of where we live. And you also said that we live, you know, Africa is in us, right? So I think that it was helpful for me to read about Africa, but it wasn't until I started visiting uh, Africa, I could feel that when I go home, Africa will still be in me. It had to be, for me, there had to be the connection. You know, just when the when the plane, when the wheels touched the tarmac, I could feel it go through my body. You know, I, I remember the first time, you know, and 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 what I what I'm saying is that I felt like there was a, an affinity that that did not really happen. It, it, it was in my mind, but but it wasn't in my heart. And so it was after that experience, the you know, and and then every time I go back, and I think it's been 14 times to some part of the continent, I have the same experience all over again. I have to fight the tears. So so I come home and I realize I'm an African, but I also understand that there are so many people around me who have not actualized that experience. So many people, so many African Americans who have not made that connection. So they are offended when when someone calls them African American. You know, they said, "No, I'm I'm black," um, which is fine. I mean, I'm black too. But I'm just saying that if you are saying that because you are offended to be identified with Africa, that is problematic. Yes, yes, I agree. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mo. Identity crisis, that's a key issue. And it all goes back to what Professor Wen said about, um, how did she put it now? I want to quote her, collapsing colonial boundaries. Very, very important. And it starts from the mind. So we have to be awakened before you can. In fact, you need, you need to help yourself first before you help others. And if you are not awakened to these realities, to your identity and to where you come from, and where you are going, how can you then educate others? How can we spread the message, the awareness that we need for the young people to reclaim back who they were, what has been stolen from them? Thank you for that, Dr. Mo. Right, we've got, um, we still have almost 10 minutes. So we can have one more, more comment. 
Well, it's nobody's comment, and I'd like to make one more comment. And I, I'd like to point <laughs> to a couple of our colleagues. One has left us, Professor Ali Missouri, who is a Kenyan. Uh, he's talked extensively, wrote extensively about co colonialism. And in his work, his, three, his nine part series, Africans, the Triple Heritage, points to this problem that we're dealing with today our own identity and how that is a problem. Colonialism didn't last for very long, as he said, but it left a legacy, a legacy of segregation, a legacy of superiority of whites over blacks. We have to begin to rethink how we can build our relationships with the other, with people who are different from us, who think they're superior to us. And we, we are going to have to do so in the way we build partnerships, because it is those partnerships that displace us, that bring things to our doors that doesn't favor us. And I think that's really where the conversation should be. What I'm happy about is that there are younger scholars who are beginning to take on the baton. And one person I want to point to uh, is Professor Lumumba. Uh, who is also a Kenyan and quite prolific, quite passionate about what, how he positions Africa. And I think that's key. Our positions in global affairs has to be rethought and taught and, you know, explained to the young people. Uh, I think a continuous kind of process of, you know, dealing with how we think, you know, our young people think anything made outside of Africa or anything else in Europe or America is superior to whatever is done in Africa. That has to be done differently now. I, I teach my young boys now that they have a place here and they can lead in so many aspects. So let's begin the conversation from our own different homes, our young people and really make them feel great about themselves and extend to our families. And that's how we should be. There are Africans born in America who are returning to the continent. It's so important. And that connection that you know, David talked about is so important. I, you know, I was, you know, none of my family members were ever enslaved. But when I went to Gori Island, I felt what it was like to go through that door of no return when I was looking at the Atlantic Ocean and thinking that some of my people went through this door and never saw this continent again. That feeling is so important, reconnecting with Africa and being there, it's something we have to experience. I, you know, I was born in Africa, but Nigeria specifically, but every time I go to Nigeria or when I get on the plane like David described and land in Lagos, Motala Mohammed Airport, there's a feeling, a euphoria that you can never explain. That's, what, how we, that's why it's so important. You know, I could go on forever, but I'm going to quit now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Very excited to be with this group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor James. Um, yeah, since we are running out of time, what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm going to give our other panelists just a chance to make a closing remark, even if it's a one-liner, just very quickly, then we go around and then we can do our vote of thanks and thank Veronica properly because I deliberately left left that one for last. <laughs> okay, so maybe we start from Portia. Yeah, this was a great panel. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of it. Um, I've been kind of open to so many avenues of thought. The idea of um, migration being something that's affected us spiritually, physically, and culturally. So thank you very much. And yeah, I think we should carry this conversation ongoing. Definitely, I agree with that. We, we haven't had the last of this yet. We'll, we'll definitely meet again and continue this conversation. Thank you. Um, so let's go now to, well, virtually all of us have said one thing or the other, but let's go to Professor Wen. Yes. I'll end by saying, let us all be accountable. Let us all be accountable in terms of relearning and learning and um, acknowledging things that we cannot do and being willing to collaborate, build relationships and partnerships. And I, th I think there is a lot of hope. I believe there is a lot of hope up, up there. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mo. Yes, uh, thank you for allowing me to participate, even though I did not bring an African name. Um, it is a, it is a joy to be with you. Um, I I would like to just say simply, as in these past few years, five years or so, you've he heard the saying, believe women. Uh, I would like to say that we, uh, in the in the diaspora and Africa, believe black people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, believe black people. I like the sound of that. Um, Professor James, anything to add before we? If you can unmute. You're muted. I, I meant, I was saying that we should remain engaged. Um, engagement is the key. Uh, whether we do it at a local level, at a regional level, at a national level, and at international level. That's what it is, you know, to bring everything we have, the passion, the fire in us, to connect. And uh, whenever we see wrong, to call it. Whenever we see success, so add to it. That's really what the key is, engagement. Thank you very much. Now to you, Veronica. What can I say? I'll keep it very simple, straight to the point. Thank you very much. Um, we, we notice the work you are doing um, on the African continent. We notice what you are doing. You are one of the leading lives, emerging scholars, not just emerging scholars, but future academic leader on the continent. So keep up the good work and um, we'll give you the floor to close. We are done on our side. Asante sana. <laughs> As mama. That's what we say in the love for the Loma people in the northern part of uh, Liberia. Thank you so much. I am just so humbled and honored. And I am always grateful. Uh, I struggle a lot as a Liberian, as an African, as an international migrant. I struggle to center my spirituality and connection to my roots, as Professor Wane has said. Um, and listening to you bring a lot more questions and thoughts and possibilities and hopes what can we do moving into the future? And I am just always, always grateful to have you as mentors, as role models, as people we can learn from. And when we get discouraged that nothing has been done, I can look to you and say, yes, there are great Africans doing amazing things and leading the way that we can follow. So thank you very much. And I take your suggestions and your recommendations. I'll be reaching out to you and we will explore this possibility. We can either use this venue or we can use other venue, maybe larger venue on the continent to discuss how we can decolonize our minds and hopefully transform this into a larger publication that could reach a lot more people than our uh, limited circle that we have right now. So thank you everyone for participating. I'm honored. I'm grateful. This uh, video is going to be online. And for those who didn't participate, so the, your, your voices will still be heard by a lot more people. Over 97 people registered. So hopefully they will get to listen in a lot more. So thank you very much you. for your wonderful time and knowledge. Thank you, thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Anthony, uh, for yes. facilitating. Yes. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, you know, James S. for being part of this uh, platform. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Veronica. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for meeting all of you. Bye. If you're ever in Santa Barbara, anybody, come on over. <laughs> I will. I have to visit your church. 
Yes. Me too. Dr. Mo, I, you need to decolonize me. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Well, that, that's so what amazing. we do. And, I, uh, you know, we, you, we are online, so. Okay. Very good. Send me that. Yeah, I need okay. to listen to your preaching. Is how okay. we can decolonize from the Christianity. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's been a process for me because I did not start out thinking like this, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Me All too. right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks, James. Bye-bye, Taylor. <laughs>